Now, the primary uh, reason why uh, this area is very important is, uh, I believe, is because it's an interface between two different types of materials, but maybe more importantly, because it's an interface between two separate trades, and, and in many cases, separate industries, uh, not just companies, but industries. So there's a, a general contracting industry uh, that goes and puts in foundations, and then there's typically a specialized uh, uh, structural steel contractor uh, who gets the contract to put up the steel. And if, in many cases, of course, the subcontractor, the steel contractor might be a sub for the main contractor, but it's a different entity. I mean, it's not one body. The management is not the same. The project management is not the same. In many cases, the engineers who design them are not the same. Uh, so it's a major area of interface where there's always issues that come up simply because of lack of communication, lack of understanding what's going on, uh, um, lack of knowledge in engineering, uh, lack of quality control that's coordinated, um, and, many, and many other things. Uh, so I believe that's one reason why this is a big topic, uh, where there's a lot of questions because of this interface nature uh, of the problem. And then um, the other issue is the fact that it's actually a base plate is typically uh, in an area that's exposed to environmental hazards could be underground, could be very close to the ground, uh, in which case there's a great deal of, let's say, moisture, uh, maybe other hazards uh, in factories uh, that can attack that area. So it's also an area of risk as opposed to, let's say, high up there in the roof. Um, so I think because of these two reasons, uh, we get to see a lot of issues, a lot of problems, and also that results in a lot of questions that come into the Institute relating to base attachments. <clears throat> Emmanuel, what are the cr critical components of the assembly? Can you give us a little bit more background from a technical perspective there? Yeah, so uh, these column bases, um, the intention of these column bases is essentially to have the structural steel uh, sit on a foundation, which is typically made out of concrete. Um, so, uh, in doing that, the, the first problem that arises, of course, is that the, the strength of the steel is typically much, much higher than the strength of the concrete. And what that means is that the steel sections are likely to be much smaller than the foundation on which they sit, simply because the steel is so much stronger. And so there needs to be a way and a method to take those forces, those high forces from the steel, and put them into a foundation that's much larger. And that essentially that uh, connection between the steel and the concrete is a sensitive area because of course it's easy to puncture through the concrete uh, and to fail it in many other different ways. Uh, and so you need to, a, a method of distributing that force in such a way that the concrete can accommodate those high forces. And so one of the most important components of these base attachments is essentially a base plate that's typically quite thick uh, that distributes the force from a small steel section. When I say small, it's just small in area, but it's quite strong. Uh, to a concrete uh, that's typically, let's say, 25, 30 MPa uh, if you do a cube test. Um, so uh, after the base plate, of course, you need some way to anchor that column so that it doesn't move around. So there will typically be some sort of holding down bolt. So that's essentially the thing that's going to hold up the base plate in place, which is also anchored into the concrete uh, because it has to attach these to the base plate and the uh, holding down bolts, I mean, the concrete. And then, of course, there's typically uh, some sort of concrete structure that sits on the foundation um, to accommodate this column seat. And it's typically some sort of pedestal or a short column, in a sense, um, that has to be designed to be able to accommodate whatever forces come from that um, column. So that pedestal is a very key part of this whole uh, design and, and uh, base attachment. So it's like a, a small concrete column uh, holding down bolts and a base plate. These make up essentially, um, let's call it that area uh, that interfaces between the uh, steel columns and the foundation. And of course, th this is a, a, a pretty complex area, uh, neglected in many cases. And for, you know, a lot of people just follow some standards and try to copy what was done before. Um, but there are a lot of intricacies in, in these attachments uh, that need to be addressed depending on the use and what the application is. So, but I would say the, the three main components would be, of course, the column itself, the base plate, the holding down bolts, and the pedestal or the uh, short column that sits under the base plate. <clears throat> so, what are some of the common problems that arise at the column base locations? 
Okay, so uh, I would say the most typical question that comes in has to do with uh, these holding down bolts not being in the right location. And what that means is the way, the way these, deta these uh, columns and base plates are detailed, essentially the plate would be welded onto the column at the bottom, and then they would make holes uh, in the base plate to be able to accommodate those holding down bolts. And of course, the location of those columns has to be coordinated with the location of the uh, short stubs, the pedest what I'm calling pedestals, um, that sit on the foundation. Now, of course, as you can imagine, there's a, a steel contractor who goes off and designs the steel, the roof and the columns and everything, um, or at least details it, if not designs. Uh, and they have an assumption about where everything should sit based on the structural engineering drawings that they were uh, given uh, from the consultant. Uh, the contractor who's putting in the uh, foundations and the pedestals also has their own details that they use uh, that also arises from the design of the main engineer. Now, of course, someone's going to go in uh, right before they pour that little pedestal, and they're going to insert those holding down bolts in a, typically in a cage, some sort of uh, a template. And when they do that, it's quite possible that that template doesn't sit exactly where the steel fabricator's detail shows uh, where it should sit. Um, now, this is not necessarily to assign any blame as to which industry might make the, the mistake or the error, but clearly it's very independent bodies that are doing these two jobs. And we're talking about tolerances that are, you know, essentially within a few millimeters and centimeters here. So if it's a little bit out, it just won't work because the base plate, plate holes are relatively small. So um, this is very typical where the holding down bolts are actually not located in the correct location by the time the steel columns come down. And uh, so I would say this is the most typical and common uh, problem that people uh, see and witness. Um, there are various remedies, we can discuss them later on and other, I think the attendees can also tell us what, what they've experienced in their own projects. But I'd be surprised if there's any engineer who has worked for a few years who hasn't faced this problem uh, on site. Um, another issue that comes up a lot um, has to do with uh, people, engineers simply not knowing how to design these bases. That's, a, that's on the design side. Um, or not, not knowing how to specify uh, the various components of a base attachment. For instance, there's a piece, uh, let's say a little bit of a, let's say 25 to 50 millimeter thick grout that has to sit below the base plate. That's essentially between the pedestal and the base plate. It's, it's a filler material once the column has been uh, leveled. And that grout is a special type of specification because uh, it shouldn't be allowed to shrink much because that's, if it shrinks a lot, of course, the connection between the base plate and the grout uh, um, is no longer functional. And um, the specification of that grout, the purchase and the installation of that grout can go wrong in many cases because the contractor may not be familiar with that kind of work. Um, sometimes the base plates are quite large so they can't get the grout in there. Um, and so um, there's also issues of testing the strength of the grout. So, so there's a, 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 a large number of issues that come up uh, around the grout. Um, some contractors will go and put in post-installed holding down bolts. These are holding down bolts that get installed after the concrete pedestal has been cast. Uh, the number of problems that arise there are many, all the way from quality to how is it installed and all that. So. Um, so typically it has to do something to do with the holding down bolts or grout, I'd say. These are the, the most typical problems that arise. <clears throat> so just to, to um, pick up on the holding down bolts issue, I know that a while ago we got um, some queries related to galvanizing of holding down bolts. Could you maybe speak a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I would say uh, one interesting area of curiosity that I've had for, for several years now is the nature of these holding down bolts. Uh, when I first learned of um, these, uh, let's call it classification of steel called uh, commercial quality steel, which is a very South African thing, um, I got curious uh, about what, what that actually means because the largest volume of holding down bolts are specified as commercial quality. Um, now, what people do is they order this commercial quality steel and they try to galvanize it to protect it from environmental impacts such as corrosion because it's sitting in areas that are, let's say, sensitive to um, hazards. 
Um, so we went and did uh, put together, a, let's call it a research project uh, that we did for about three years, trying to see uh, how these holding down bolts perform in general. And we found um, some very unexpected and uh, interesting results from those studies. Um, when it came to uh, galvanizing, why I'm mentioning this now, um, is because these commercial quality, uh, let's call it holding down bolts, I assumed were essentially mild steel type of uh, holding down bolts, because that's essentially what we say in the red book. And that's generally been the consensus in the industry. What we actually found when we did, when we started doing the testing, so we, we built a, very, a pretty large foundation and put a whole bunch of different types of holding down bolts in there and started pulling them out is, uh, and of course, before we do that, we go and do coupon tests on, on, the, on the same samples, not on the exact same sample, but on a, an off cut. And we found that some of these commercial quality holding down bolts were quite strong, as in, uh, in the range of uh, equivalents in strength, let's say to a grade 8.8 .8 or 10.9 kind of uh, strength. Uh, so why I raise this now is because if these commercial quality holding down bolts or some other holding down bolts that are being specified are of that strength level, there may very well be an issue with galvanizing them because um, certain types of um, heat treated bolts uh, respond very badly to galvanizing in the sense that it makes them brittle, which is why, for instance, we don't allow uh, galvanizing of 10.9 volts. So um, when you bring up galvanizing and holding down bolts, the main issue that I would, I would say is important here is it may, it may not be sufficient to just say, use galvanized commercial quality bolts. Um, it, might, it might be required, if it has to be galvanized, that you actually say what grade of bolt uh, you want to have specified. Um, the second question, of course, is how much galvanizing do you put on there? Because that should be directly related to, of course, the hazard uh, that comes up. So we do get these questions, what you say. Uh, sometimes you get these electroplated bolts that, that really don't work in terms of performance. That means very short duration. So there's a lot of information around galvanizing holding down bolts that's also lacking. Um, so I'm glad you brought it up because it, it does come up. <clears throat> okay, so now after my, my digression, let me get my next to my next question. Um, what are some of the critical aspects of the design of, of column-based attachments? Yeah, so column-based attachments are quite complex. Um, and maybe that's why engineers uh, neglect it, uh, which is ironic because, of course, the, the more complicated something is maybe it requires more attention rather than neglect. Um, but I would say that the, the three critical things that have to be designed uh, when designing a base attachment would be the base plate itself, um, the uh, holding down bolt, and its anchorage into the concrete. So, so I would say these three are absolutely essential. And um, when I say the base plate, I don't mean just the base plate alone, but the base plate and its bearing on the concrete. So these are related. And this is what makes base plate attachment uh, designs very complicated, is that you always have to, having to deal with two different materials in the design. So when you design the base plate, you can't design it in independent of the design of the concrete because the amount of force that goes into that base plate is directly linked to the strength and performance of that concrete. Same thing when designing the holding down bolts, they can't be designed independently because one of the limit states that controls the capacity of those things in shear or in pull out is the capacity of the concrete itself and how it's reinforced, meaning what types of ties were used the good news uh, is over the past 20 years, there's a lot of good new literature and research that has gone into this uh, primarily in Europe, the US and Japan, and then a whole new method of design, uh, let's call it a regime of design called the concrete capacity method has been developed, uh, which we've implemented into our green book. Um, so we have a lot of knowledge about, um, let's call it anchorage, which basically means um, the capacity of, let's say, steel components inside concrete. So, um, and now, of course, we know Hilti and all these other anchorage type of companies are also investing quite a bit into uh, furthering that knowledge because this is an interesting and a very important uh, area of knowledge. So that's the good news in terms of design, that there are, in fact, resources 
Um, but I, I would say the most complicated aspect of design of base attachments is the fact that you're designing both steel and concrete at the same time, which people are not used to doing. Um, and so people just try to use standardized uh, what the office has used before. Um, the other aspect that is key uh, would be whether or not, meaning trying to determine whether or not that base attachment is fixed or what we call pinned, which basically means is it rigid in terms of bending. Um, there's a lot of confusion in that area, whether a type of base attachment that's designed is fixed or uh, pinned. Um, I see a lot of, uh, maybe we'll get into it later, but I see a lot of software tools that completely uh, muck it up, essentially confuse everything, uh, which is too bad. Um, I also see a lot of design that makes use of uh, a lot of stiffeners in base attachments, uh, which is a very bad idea. I know it's very common. Um, that's because the software guys uh, propose it a lot. Um, so these are the kinds of things that come up when I do get questions about base attachments and design, is how to resolve these problems. What type of base attachment is it? So meaning linking the actual base attachment to the model that the engineers are using, which is a mathematical model, and how to make that link. So there's always a, a problem in that area. <clears throat> Good. So can you maybe give us some examples? I mean, you know, we don't have to go into to, uh, the projects or, or the companies that gave the examples, but what are some of the, the common issues that come up or common challenges or common queries that we've had related to this specific topic um, over the last while? I would say the most uh, important one that comes from engineers who design is asking for resource, meaning to know how to do it, to design, how to design it. So uh, they ask for resources uh, because um, there's just a dearth of, uh, let's call it tools. You know, when you, to, in order to design beams, columns, there are thousands and thousands of, in this, and now it might be tens of thousands of software tools that help you to design columns and beams and, you know, that kind of stuff. But there's a real problem when it comes to um, base connections, meaning there's just not a lot of, because the area of study itself is quite new relatively. So um, what people have done is either just guessed uh, or they call us to ask what we have. So that, of course, that's one, one good reason why we wrote the green book is because there was this issue of um, how do you actually do it? Uh, so we do have resources that we share in, in that sense, there's the green book. There's also a digital uh, thing that we wrote, the e-toolkit. Um, there are books internationally also available on this topic. Uh, and for those who want to really dig into it, this concrete capacity methods have been written about quite a bit in Europe, in the US especially. Very hard to access things from Japan because of language. But uh, most of the American, Canadian, British, and European uh, resources are, are relatively uh, easy for South Africans to access. Um, so this, this is typically the type of problem that people pose, which is, how do you do this thing? How do you design it if you wanted to do it properly? And of course, the, the, we also give courses, um, maybe we didn't mention that, but the Institute gives a number of technical courses, um, one of which we haven't done in a while now is on connections. So we cover this quite a bit. Um, and I also cover it in uh, postgraduate courses for the guys who do their master's degree at WITS because I, 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 I lecture that course. Um, so there's a few avenues where you can get it. <clears throat> I see we've got a question from Ian Beggs um, asking about Procon. Would Procon be the best program to design in this case? Um, so um, I've reviewed, so this has been a while now. Uh, so I can't say anything about what uh, is going on right now, but I can talk about a few years ago, let's say two, three years ago, uh, when we were exploring this topic. Um, there were very, very few software uh, tools that were doing anything that I would consider to be good engineering. And in there, I'm including Procon. Now, we support Procon because it's a local product. When I say support, I mean we always encourage Procon, uh, the engineers and the designers of Procon, to focus uh, especially on connections. We've, we've tried many different initiatives to try to get them also involved with uh, programming things that are good in terms of engineering. So this is not necessarily a diss on Procon, but in general, uh, the guys who produce um, 
structural engineering software are themselves not practicing engineers. Uh, and very rarely are they also researchers in that area. Uh, they're typically programmers who have a background in engineering. And this is where everything starts falling apart. So when it comes to having to program uh, things like connections, they always fall apart. And um, so this is, not, this, is, uh, this is true across the board. So this is not just about Procon. Um, so what, what we always say is, for instance, um, for base attachments, and, and in fact, in the case of Procon, one of their programmers, uh, one of their senior programmers, has taken one of our problems in the green book and tried to research it and has actually got a PhD out of it uh, recently, a, pro a project that we supported. Um, so in, this, in that sense, he's quite knowledgeable about, for instance, the interaction between base plates and the concrete. So he'll have, he has a specialized knowledge in that area. So hopefully his program, he has uh, uh, helped support this development in Procon. Uh, but um, the one thing that, for instance, the Procon does, which is uh, I find to be bad engineering, is like adding stiffness in these base plates and stuff. So, so these are the kinds of things that um, you can tell the moment you see a program that it's non-practicing engineers who programmed it, simply mm -hmm. because it doesn't make economic sense, the kinds of things that they suggest. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so in that sense, I, I, I think there's good prospects for Procon to develop in the right direction, but I think they're just starting. So... I would say to date, I have not seen a lot of tools yet uh, that I would say are good in terms of doing these base attachments. So the engineer has to be awake and, and actually do their own uh, learning and research uh, before applying the use of these software tools. <clears throat> right, so I think I'd like to just open up to, to our participants. Um, if there are any questions that you'd like to raise, if I could just ask you either to put your camera on or pop your, your question in the chat. Uh, Terry Smith, uh, would you like to comment on galvanized holding down bolts? Paula's suggested uh, that perhaps you should uh, add, add in. Or is Terry in? Yes, I just want to check. I don't see Terry in. I think he's popped out. Um, I don't think he's here anymore, Paula. Um, any, anyone have any questions? Oh, Terry is here. Terry? Maybe he's muted. Or he's off to lunch. Yeah, no, he's, you, you, there, there we there. go. <laughs> I'm, 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 I've written a long explanation for everyone, but I don't know how to send it. Ah, send well, it to Denise. You, well, how can you, I send it? it you just, just put it in the chat. Email, email it to Denise. It's or in, I'll put it in the chat. It's in everyone. And when I click on everyone, it says tick everyone. Then it says send chat to, and I'm not sure how to do that. Uh, you should you should just be able to press in. Well, we've got you. We've got you on the line yeah. now. You can. Okay. So, you could just explain. So, <laughs> Terry, okay. you can just read your write up. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, Manuel, you mentioned about the strength of bolts that you can galvanize, and uh, you're quite right when it comes to ten point nines. I mean, why would one want to use a ten point nine for holding down bolts? It doesn't really make sense. But ten point nines are not easily galvanized, and in fact, in South Africa. We did start hot to galvanizing because there were imports and the imports were very expensive. So, but because of the expertise that we have in South, in South Africa now, I would not guarantee galvanizing at 10.9. It should come from a more sophisticated country like uh, Germany or wherever. Um, um, coating effectiveness achieved will obviously be in accordance with um, the SANS 121 specification, which is based on the diameter of the bolt but also the steel reacti reactivity. So in my experience, most times the holding down bolt uh, coating thickness is far in excess of what the specification calls for. But what's very important above that is that the nuts that you use for hot tip galvanized holding down bolts are oversized according to the standard, which is um, 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 SANS 14713 where we talk about the certain yeah. oversizing of the nut. I beg your pardon. Um, the other thing I mentioned is um, the shape of the, of the holding down bolt. Um, in my experience, 
I find that um, consulting engineers use various shapes, uh, L shapes, J shapes, U shapes, et cetera, et cetera. And most often, especially when the bolts are becoming larger, they are very difficult to centrifuge. Um, as you know, in South Africa, we only have a couple of centrifuge galvanizers in Johannesburg. There's nothing along the coast other than in Durban, there's a small centrifuge galvanizer. Um, and often these bolts can't go into a centrifuge because of the cage being too small. My experience is that um, uh, if you want success in terms of a hot tip galvanized bolt, um, ideally use a hot tip galvanized threaded rod and put plates at the bottom, which I think the red book actually had in place at one stage to keep you having that, uh, that hold down position and then use oversized nuts top and bottom of that plate and you will always have success. And there might be an area where you cut the bolt off at the top um, where there's no coating um, and depending on the atmosphere, whether you want to coat that over with some repair method. Excellent. Okay, that's, that's that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for your input, Terry, and thank you, Philo, for, for bringing that question up. Um, Emmanuel, we, we have another question. Um, if stiffness are just, not yeah, recommended... Just, just before uh, you go on... Do you want to... Yeah, go for it. Yeah, just, I wanted to say one, one thing about what Terry just mentioned. Uh, it's just a curiosity. I don't know if people would be interested. But when we did our pull-out tests, uh, we found that um, these plate solutions that we have in the Red Book, of course, they work. Uh, but we found that we could get just as much capacity out of a lot of uh, these holding down bolts by just having a nut at the base. So I just thought that I would share that. Um, that, that says a lot about how much we don't understand how Anchorage works uh, because a nut is not very big compared to an anchor plate. Yeah. Um, but that's just one of, one of the things we discovered from our hundreds of tests that we did. Yeah. Manuel, it's David here. Um, yeah. That the the increase in or the capacity of a of a threaded rod with just a nut may also be very strongly linked to the bond between the threaded section of the threaded section of the rod and the concrete itself. Yes. Yeah, so so we had a, a number of control tests that we did without a nut. So so we tested many different things, of course, because we were trying to have controls um, and. Uh, the rods, the threaded rods in concrete without a nut have some capacity, as you say, because of the bond. Uh, but with the nut, we were getting significantly higher capacities, almost to the same effect as having an anchor uh, plate, okay. which, is, which, which was highly, uh, which was very surprising to a lot of us. Okay, thanks. <laughs> yes. Great. So the question that we've got was, if, stiff, if stiffness are not recommended, uh, would the preference be for, for thicker base plates? Okay, you're on mute, Emmanuel. So, yes, who did this question come from that I can address directly? Um, the, the, answer, the short answer is yes. You, you're muted, Denise, so I didn't hear you. Uh, it was, it, um, it's G. Batel. I'm not sure right. what the first name so, is. So, all right. So, yes. Um, um, the least expensive solution for a base plate is a thick base plate. Uh, and the reason for that should be obvious. Um, uh, when, you, when you buy a piece of material, if you're a fabricator, let's say, remember in South Africa, we can get plates uh, in, thick, in quite thick plates. I mean, you can get the thicks at 50 millimeter thickness, uh, even higher, um, which, which would be very rare in, in many applications. So, um, uh, you can buy that plate, you know, per kilogram, whatever it costs, some, whatever amount it costs, as compared to when you go for a thin plate and you put a stiffener on, uh, now you're actually having to do fabrication work, including welding, handling, uh, and a whole host of quality control that you have to do. So, so it's not even comparable. And um, uh, I have never seen a, a, a solution with a stiffener that is more economical than a thicker plate. So, but if you have seen one, uh, please share, and I, I'll be curious to see. <clears throat> Great. Do we have any more questions? If you have a question, just put your uh, put your camera on or pop it in the chat. Llewellyn, you've still got your camera on. Any questions from your side? Uh, no. Uh, <clears throat> I just have to, what um, 
Uh, Manuel was saying earlier on about uh, the bolt itself, the anchor bolts. Um, I mean, I noticed on site, I worked on an LNG plant, and uh, there it's very critical to have bolts centralized properly. And not only the tip of the, the, the bolt, but also to make sure that the whole alignment of the bolt is accurately down. Because we have, we've done the civil and underground works, but then when the guys come in for the actual structural steel, when you fit the base plate over, then the bolt is quite not on angle. And uh, and, and if it's not 100% perpendicular or, or parallel with the uh, um, concrete, then you have a, a tremendous lot, lot of problems. That means that there's a lot of rework to be done during that time. But it's a good point that he brought up earlier on. Right. Questions, comments, anyone feel free to, to chime in. Emmanuel, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I see David has also unmuted yeah. himself now. I'd like to uh, add well, a, little sure. bit, a little bit more to Llewellyn's comment. He made a mention, and it's a very valid mention, of, of the bolts being perpendicular or vertical. Um, and of course, if someone bends them into the right position, they may be standing outside of, out of vertical. So the preferred method is, especially if there's pockets, is to bend the bolt. You have one bend to bend the bolt into the right position, another bend to bring it back to vertical. Um, so you would have a kink in the bolt. And if you go back to your normal reinforcing detail standards, the maximum permissible in the kink is one in 10. So if you have a rebar with a kink in it, it would be a, a kink of one in 10, a straight rebar. Um, so that's what I generally work to if I have to work out the acceptability of bending the bolts into the right position. Yeah, Dave, it's quite difficult to, to bend uh, M30s. Um, and I have experience have <laughs> with that on site that you're sitting with a, a, a series of bolts, not only four per column, sometimes eight per column. Uh, especially these big structural steels, what we put up is 2,000 tons uh, over a, a 22 pedestals, uh, and each have like eight uh, bolts M uh, M30s. So it's very difficult to bend them. So yeah, it's it's very important to before you even cast the quality control is in place, so that everything get checked properly, and it's all vertical accordingly to the design, and make your life easier. Yeah, good point. Great. Emmanuel, did you want to uh, add anything yes, to that? Just a, yes, a comment on uh, both what uh, Llewellyn and, and Dave are talking about. Just uh, uh, some, a question that I, I had to respond to, but this is actually before my days here at this institute, but it's very relevant. So we get a lot of questions here on um, guys who have holding down bolts that are too short. What that means is that they're... Um, somehow they don't make it past the base plate uh, and they can't get, seem to get a nut on it. And um, what to do about that, right? So of course you need to get the nut on, on the top side of that base plate. And sometimes because the, these holes are oversized, you actually have to put a plate washer, which is typically much thicker than a regular, let's say small washer. So, so, so the holding down bolt has to project up, not just the height of the nut, but maybe even more so because of the plate washer. So if the if the blade if the holding down bolt is too short, uh, then what do you do, right? Because it's already been cast in there. So we do get those questions. It's not as common as the misplaced holding down bolt question, but we've got it. Let's say maybe twenty or thirty times before. Um, and there are various remedies for that. Um, uh, there are people who go and do some sophisticated, you know, welding of another holding down bolt on top of the existing one. Um, my favorite solution. Uh, is to use coupling nuts. And people used to tell me that those don't exist, but I have found them in South Africa. So they do exist um, uh, and uh, they can be graded. What that means is that you can find nuts that are actually of the right grade for the type of holding down bolt that you're using. Uh, it may require widening the holes in the base plate a little bit um, because uh, if, if, it's, if the holes were not essentially oversized, uh, so that's my favorite solution. So I thought I would share that. But but the, the story I wanted to tell was uh, essentially the opposite. There, there was a very large building um, that had been put up. Uh, this is in Chicago now, um, owned by the ex-president um, of the US. 
and they were about to come and put on an antenna on the roof. And uh, these antennas are very large. So this is, this is essentially a, a 90 story building on which they were putting on, a, this is the Trump Tower in Chicago where they're putting on an antenna. So the question that came in um, was they found that the holding down bolts were projected too far out compared to the drawing. You know, like they were too long. And uh, is there any issue? And of course, you know, for, for, at first it was just like, well, what's the issue? Too short is a problem, but too long is not a problem. Uh, but of course, like I, after a little bit of five minutes of thought, we, we, we sat there and we thought, well, there could very well be a problem because maybe it doesn't project into the concrete far enough. So maybe they did order the right length of holding down bolts, but they didn't embed it sufficiently enough. And this is very difficult to evaluate once the thing has been cast in uh, to find out how deep it's been cast in. Um, so they were actually bringing the antenna on a helicopter. So these are helicopter cranes that they use to bring in these antennas. They've already pre-assembled and they cost a lot of money. I don't know if any one of you have ever ordered a helicopter crane. They're very expensive. They have them in South Africa as well. Um, and they had to uh, cancel the order for the antenna because there was no way to establish whether or not those holding down bolts were uh, buried deep enough. Essentially, it had to be, it all get dug up again. So that was a very expensive mistake uh, by a contractor who, pro who, we don't know if it was embedded sufficiently enough or not, but it projected out too far. And that was a very expensive mistake either way. If, if anything, maybe they should have pretended and just cut the holding down bolt. <laughs> But I don't think you would do that a hundred stories up. So <laughs> that advice did not come from the Steel Institute. Disclaimer. Disclaimer. <laughs> so the, yes, go for it, David. No, the, the projection of holding down bolts or the acceptance of holding down bolts is an interesting contracting conundrum in very often on South African jobs, where you'll have one contractor doing the the uh, civil works and the bases. We have another contractor specialist doing the structural steel. And the normal QA procedure is for the structural steel contractor to do a, uh, a survey, a measured survey of the holding down bolts prior to accepting them on, beho uh, on behalf of the owner from the civil contractor. What it does is it draws a contractual obligation line between the two contractors. But very often on, on big jobs, uh, that part of the QA process gets missed. And then there's a huge argument between all parties when things don't fit or the projection as Emmanuel just described is wrong. Anyone, anyone else like to add any of the challenges that they've had related to base plates or, or holding down bolts or any comments that you'd just like to, to contribute um, your thoughts? Yes, um, I'd actually like to ask something. I can hear me. Yeah. Yes, I want to know if, if you're using um, couplers, <clears throat> either to extend your holding down post, like Emmanuel has said, is, does that affect the performance if, for instance, you've got dynamic loading in that, uh, in the form of operations and stuff? Will it affect the performance of the couplers? Is it, does it have any effect if you've got a dynamic loading in it? Thanks. Thank you. Emmanuel? Um, yeah, Nasi, um, nice to see you again. I remember you from, I think, the last course. Um, this is an interesting question of how to address dynamic loading on holding down bolts. We addressed it last week also. Uh, I don't know exactly why. I think we were discussing bolts. Um, <clears throat> the, the, using nuts, whether it's coupling nuts or just regular nuts, in a dynamically loaded structure is always a problem in that it can loosen. So this is the most typical question that comes up is how do you stop a nut from loosening from let's say vibration uh, from a machine or it could even be from wind uh, for machine support stacks, uh, gantries of this type. Uh, different people have different solutions. Uh, there are various uh, proprietary products, for instance, like uh, lo uh, uh, what are called uh, lock nuts. Um, some people do double nuts. Um, my, my preferred specification is, let's call it the most uh, simple, maybe brute force way, which is just to uh, strip the thread around the nut. Uh, and you do this literally by going in there with a chisel or something and essentially breaking the thread. Uh, a few of them actually, not just one. 
Um, so, so my solution is not elegant, but I know it works because I've tried to undo a knot uh, that has been stripped and it's very difficult. Um, so that's the, that's the most typical question that comes up. Now, if you're asking questions regarding, let's say, fatigue cracking, which is yet another issue that comes up uh, in holding down bolts that are dynamically loaded, uh, the one thing we were discussing last week was, for instance, pre-tensioning these uh, holding down bolts uh, because it does reduce the stress range in a holding down bolt when you pre-stress it, just, just like what you get when you pre-stress bolts, regular bolts in steel. Um, and the one comment I had made that at that time was that pre-stressing holding down bolts is a very complicated problem because you're pre-stressing against concrete, which creeps. So the chances that you're going to lose that pre-stress is very high. And if you, if you, for those people who do prescribe pre-stressed holding down bolts, I, I'm glad you brought this question up because we are discussing the uh, holding down bolts in concrete. Um, the guys who specify uh, holding down bolts that are pre-stressed and do not specify along with it a maintenance program that basically means pre-stressing it every few months or twice a year or three times a year will lose their pre-stress, I, I would assume, within a year, uh, much less than a year. Uh, because the level of creep in concrete is quite high. Um, so uh, I do have one solution that we've put into the green book um, uh, on how to address this problem. And we discussed it last week. It has to do with a, a, with a steel sleeve that you put around the holding down bolt during the casting process. So if you, get, if you have the green book, you can find it in the green book in the uh, chapter 10, uh, which is on base attachments. Uh, and, and I have a, a solution for how you actually calculate the amount of pre-stress that you need based on how much uh, you would like to reduce your uh, stress threshold. So, so it's, it's essentially for a purpose of fatigue design. Um, so, that, so these are the two issues that I'm aware of, but other people might have other thoughts on coupling nuts that I haven't given thought to. <clears throat> but uh, if anyone wants to, to comment on that, I see we do have a few comments in the chat, um, but let Hi. me go for it. This is Gal Batai. Sorry, I seem to have been on mute before. Um, I just wanted to share an experience I had uh, whilst working on site. And the recommendation is not to use any high strength uh, anchors. Um, and the reason we found what had happened is um, the it was a different engineering company. Uh, we had recommended we were executing the works uh, uh, in construction and we had recommended they don't use grade 8.8 anchors for a very large structure. They proceeded and what had happened was is the contractor on site never having worked with grade 8.8s, he welded, he tack welded the cage onto the anchors. Now these are M46s. And um, what happened was when we started, uh, we started tightening down the structure, we started having anchors snap due to uh, embrittlement, due to modern site forming in, in, the, in, in the anchors due, on these grade 8.8s. So this led to a very expensive exercise of coring out a number of anchors and, uh, and a four month delay on the project. So uh, just sharing the experience that uh, avoiding high strength anchored or anchors on anchor bolts is uh, to avoid them at all costs. And if you are required to use it, then uh, the contractor must be well aware of the dangers of uh, the restrictions around using those anchors. Emmanuel, did you want yeah, to respond to that? Yes, thanks. That, yes, that's an excellent point um, uh, that was just made. Um, and then just a question, Emmanuel, what is, personally, I haven't worked with the South African codes for about 15 years now. I'm, I'm mainly based overseas and I still by chance get emails. I used to be registered and I used to be registered with SICI and I thought I'd just attend. Is uh, the international codes have different ways of addressing shear transfer to anchors. So the Euro code, the recent Euro code is uh, very little shear can be transferred to anchors while the American codes, uh, it's a little gray about how many of the anchors you consider is it half or is it only two of the four? What is what is your viewpoint on shear transfer on anchors on base from base plates? Yeah, all right. So th these are two excellent points. Uh, we address them in, in, in quite a bit of depth in when I give the course on connections. Um, the first one is uh, any and all steel, not just holding down bolts, 
uh, that has been quenched and tempered to affect its mechanical properties. That's what we call heat treatment for the purpose of getting higher strengths. Um, you have to be very careful with uh, when doing welding around it, simply because um, these are heat treated, which means by introducing high temperature into that steel, uh, the mechanical properties, essentially the, the, the ordering of the crystals and the grains uh, in that steel will be affected. Um, for those of you who remember your material science. Uh, so uh, excellent point um, that if you are using a quenched and tempered type of holding down bolt, then uh, welding should be avoided entirely. If you have to insist on doing welding, then of course, uh, the heat treatment has to essentially be redone or you have to have a very specific uh, type of uh, welding procedure uh, that can uh, prevent this loss of mechanical properties. Now, this links back to the question that I raised earlier, which is what is commercial quality steel in South Africa? And from my experience, commercial quality steel can very much be uh, heat treated steel. Uh, that's what we experienced when we started going out and buying the stuff. So there is a little bit of warning there too now in that you can't just simply assume commercial quality steel, so go and weld it. Uh, if you want something to be welded onto your holding down bolt, I, I suggest you specify an actual grade, um, which is mild, which meaning it's not a heat treated uh, steel, but it's graded as opposed to commercial quality. So this might be a major change in industry practice. So I'm, gl I'm glad you raised it. Um, the second question is uh, regarding shear. Um, now shear can be carried in the base plate in three different ways. Uh, one is simply using the friction between the base plate and the, and the grout. Uh, the second way is through these holding down bolts. And the third way is if you have a shear lug, which is essentially a, a piece of steel plate or something welded to the bottom of the base plate. Um, and typically you can't combine uh, the capacities that you get out of these three methods because each one of them um, requires different levels of deformation to engage and give you that shear capacity. Um, now, the one that's most complicated here uh, is the one that uh, relates to holding down bolts. And the reason being, a lot of these holes are oversized, the base plate holes. Uh, and so to engage that uh, holding down bolt might require quite a bit of movement in that column base before it engages the holding down bolts. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the way I've done it before, uh, I can only talk about what I've done before. I, I, I know that um, different codes address it differently. Um, of course, to assume that all four, four uh, bolts will be engaged does not make any sense because it's unlikely that all four will be uh, bearing against one edge. And then, of course, what do you do for shear in the other direction? Uh, to, to assume that one or two are engaged might very well be reasonable. Uh, just, this is just from surveys of base plates that have been done, let's say, in the US. Uh, but um, what I have done before is I do use all four of them. But to do that, I use um, plate washers that are of the right size that are welded onto the base plate. So um, of course that is site welding. Um, and um, so in that sense, it's not desirable, uh, but uh, it does work where you can make use of all four holding down bolts. Um, and we do have design methods for what the capacity is of these holding down bolts loaded in shear. That's the stuff I was talking about earlier where there's a great deal of new knowledge that has been produced um, in the last 20 years. <clears throat> Manuel, I see we've got a couple of comments in the chat. Um, I'm just going to go through, through some of them. Oh, somebody needs to mute their mic and check who that is. Okay, so we've got uh, a comment from Ian Ferreira uh, saying quality control without proper supervision creates a large amount of issues for engineers. Um, I'm not sure if you want to comment anything on that. Uh, well, just... well, I would, I would just, all, all I would say is what Dave said is absolutely correct, that the cheapest way to have your holding down bolts in the right place is to make sure that there's a survey done before the columns arrive on site. All these other methods that people use, such as using chemset bolts and whatever, whatever are all more expensive in the end. They, they look cheap at the beginning, but they're typically much more expensive because of the quality control issues that, I mean, of course you can neglect quality control, but you shouldn't. Uh, if you do it properly, the cheapest uh, way to get everything right is to have a survey done um, before the columns, well, well before the columns ever uh, arrive 
and the fabricator is there to erect. Okay, great. Another comment from David, David Haynes. Uh, we avoid using high strength anchors as you can't tell the difference between these and lower strength, and lower strength grade anchors with the risk that you will get the wrong anchors cast in. And then a question from Ian Biggs. Would you say that there's a minimum or a maximum depth of grout required between concrete and base plates? Yeah, so the, these, uh, uh, for those of you who have been on site when column is being erected, um, a lot, erectors will use one of two methods to, to uh, let's call it, to plumb their columns when they're putting them down, assuming the column is vertical, of course, in the design. Uh, one is to use these packs, essentially plates underneath. Um, so essentially they go and just sit on these plates that are themselves are sitting on the pedestal on the concrete. The second method is to use leveling nuts, which are essentially nuts with washers that go below the base plate. And so they can sit on those nuts. Uh, in both cases, the purpose of all of this is to level the column. And, and, the, and the why the column has to be level, meaning plumb, uh, is because if it's not plumb, if you actually introduce a lateral force into the building that has not been accounted for by the engineer. So, um, so what we do is in our, when we write our standards, we say, well, engineer, you must design to this type of lateral load in case it's not plumb. That's the notional loads that we ask engineers to put in. That's in 10162. And then we write a commensurate document, which is SANS 2000 CS1, which is an erection tolerance document that relates to how plumb a building, a column has to be. And, and, and there's a tolerance there. And these two are linked. So because this has to happen is why you need uh, that space for grout is because you have to have this leveling space. So, so, that, so I'm describing now the, the reason why we have that location, that's that gap between the base plate and the pedestal. So how thick can it be? Is there a minimum or maximum? I would say um, minimum would be that the person has to be able to level it. And if this is a this is a big paste plate, and you specify a, a grout thing of ten millimeters, it's not going to work simply because there may not be enough play, uh, either for the nuts or the leveling plates or all these other things. If you make it too thick, now you have the problem of structural failure of the grout itself, which is too thick, meaning because this is not a reinforced uh, part of the the, the 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 structure. The grout is very much an integral part of the structure. So it needs to have a, a thickness that works. So I would say the, the standard thicknesses that are very common would be anywhere between let's say 30 millimeters and let's say 60 or 70 millimeters. I would not go anywhere outside of this bound uh, simply because the grout does not perform well if it's too thick. And if it's too thin, you can't level the column. So, so, so in my experience, this is where I would go. Um, and uh, I've already talked about the specification of the grout itself, which is, which is not regular grout. It's not the stuff you put, uh, I don't know, you use when you're building your brick wall. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, Emmanuel, we've got a question from Musa. Um, how is Autodesk Advanced Steel linked to the Red Book, if so? Um, so Autodesk has a product called Advanced Steel, which is their detailing program. Uh, the most typical detailing program that we use in South Africa is Tecla, which is from another company. Um, so how's it linked to our books? Um, Tecla and Auto uh, Advanced Steel uh, are products from, one, one is European and one is American. In fact, both are American now because Tecla has been sold to an American company. But um, they use standards that are from Europe and America, as, as, you, as you can imagine. So um, a lot of our documents, for example, SANS 10162, which means also our red book and green book or whatever, follow from primarily Canadian standards. So in that sense, they're all linked because um, these uh, detailing softwares make use of a great deal of North American, uh, let's call it standards. And we are also somewhat based on these North American standards. So in that way, we're linked, meaning we're all trying to achieve the same goals. But there will always be variations. For instance, like I said before, um, it very rarely makes sense to put stiffeners in base plates. But I'm sure Tecla and Advanced Steel and all these guys will easily allow you to put in stiffeners and all these other things. So, so 
uh, these are detailing programs in the sense that they're not design programs. So uh, do they integrate our standards into their software? That's unlikely because these are our standards. Um, at one point, we did make an effort to try to integrate the green book standards into uh, AutoCAD Autodesk products, especially advanced steel. And uh, like I said before, we've also made efforts before to integrate our standards into Procon, who are also strongly linked with Autodesk because they're a reseller of Autodesk. So we've made some attempts to get our standards embedded in there, but I would say it's up to you as the engineers and detailers here, South African engineers and detailers to make sure that you are implementing the standards that we have in the green book and red book irrespective of which software you're using, meaning that they're not going to be designed to satisfy South African standards. So it's the engineers and detailers who have to do that work. That's, uh, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I see the, uh, one more comment in the, in the chat. In problem situations, epoxy grout can be used, which can be as thin as 10 millimeters, depending on the vendor. Um, Amay, do you want to just quickly respond to that and then we can wrap up? Yeah, so um, uh, not, not quite sure what this is referring to, if it's referring to the grout between the base plate and the pedestal or uh, epoxy as in for the holding down bolts. Uh, essentially, uh, these are the what I called post-installed systems. Um, in either case, uh, I'm not a big fan. Um, if it's if the comment was in re reference to base plate, the, that gap between base plate and, and foundation, 10 millimeters in my view is too small for a practical erection. Uh, if this comment was in regards to using post-installed, um, uh, what they call chemset, epoxy, all these different names, like a Hilti product or a Fisher product for the holding down bolts. Again, I'm not a big fan of those because those do require installation that is relatively uh, quality control sensitive. Uh, so especially for uh, columns that have um, shear, uplift, bending in them, uh, I would go with the traditional methods, which is the cast-in uh, bolts. So that's my, my number one preferred method. <clears throat> okay, one last, last, last question um, from Anati. What is your take on chemical anchors as holding down bolts? And then we can wrap up. Well, yeah, so my, my view is bad idea. Short, short and sweet. Right, um, thank you everybody for joining us. We do hold these sessions every two weeks. Um, so keep an eye on your inboxes for details of our next session um, Zoom link. Uh, the, for those of you that are members of the Steel Institute, we will be putting all of these recordings up on our website in the member login area. We'll be sure to send you a mail with the links to those uh, so that you can review the material afterwards. Um, if you've got any suggestions for topics or any questions, um, or you just want to, to um, give us some suggestions for future sessions, you can send them either to technical at saisc.co.za or you can send them through to Emmanuel. Uh, Emmanuel, I've forgotten how to spell your name. A-M-A. Do you want to do that email address? U-E-L. Yes. <laughs> just, just send them to technical. It's, it's, it's much easier. <laughs> Um, so yeah, we really appreciate your, your participation um, and we look forward to seeing you on the next session. Um, until the end of April, all of these sessions will be free of charge to non-members as well. Uh, so you can invite your colleagues along to participate. Um, the topics that we'll be covering are on the Steel Institute website, um, or if you have any questions, you can also just um, send them through to the technical email.